that you use for cows. What is the cow thing? <laughs> in what way does yeah, that come in? Are you, why, are you giving a, why are you spraying cows with your love potion? <laughs> <laughs> this one says, I trust cows more than chemists. <laughs> the organic cook's bible. <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Science, where we interview professors, professionals, and graduate students using pop culture references as a talking point. Um, my name is Heidi, and with me I have Anne. Hello. Hey, Anne. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about um, a Rick and Morty episode, Rick Potion Number 9, and we brought in our special guest to discuss some of the science behind this episode. His name is Josh Berrios. Hello, Josh. Hey. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you a grad student? I'm a PhD student here at the University of Utah, and uh, I'm in neuroscience, uh, and I work on uh, neuromodulatory systems, uh, which means it's it's uh, neuromodulators are the kinds of neurotransmitters uh, like oxytocin. Uh, that have modulatory effects on on their targets. So I think we might get into this a little bit in a, just a little bit, but uh, you know that's that's the general uh, sense. Yeah, nice. So oxytocin, that's something that came up in a recent Rick and Morty episode. And if that's I right. remember correctly, you're a big Rick and Morty fan, right? That's right. I am. I am. So I, I saw this episode uh, a while back, and when you mentioned the idea for this podcast, I I just jumped on it and I thought, okay, this is absolutely perfect. We should do this. Yeah. Great. So in this episode, we have Morty, who's a high school student, and like all high school students, is dreading the flu season dance and needing to find a date. So <laughs> also, let's talk about a flu yeah. season dance. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah that's a great I, this time is a to have, really awful idea. <laughs> have a big congregation of high school students in a small area. Yeah, yeah. right. To that's celebrate that. the flu season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do. That's just a thing that happens. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> But if you're trying to find a love potion, I guess the first place you would ask is your mad scientist uncle for help. You can't blame him for asking. <laughs> Although, you know, I, you have to say that the, the, the ethics of this kind of thing is a, are a little bit questionable, right? Yeah. Uh, but this is not an ethics podcast. This is a science podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about the science. So what exactly does um, Rick do to make this love potion for Morty? So what he does in the show is he... There are two ingredients to the love potion. There is oxytocin that he extracted from a vole, and there is Morty's DNA, which he gets from a piece of Morty's hair. Uh, and so it, it's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple recipe, honestly. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty doable. You know, it's elegant. It is... It's impressive in its simplicity. Yeah, if you have a garage lab like like Rick does, I guess you could just whip one up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and there's some sort of like centrifuge looking machine that he puts it into and it hums for a minute yeah. and so scientific. Out, out pops yeah. <laughs> adds credibility vial, to vial of differently colored liquid that's you know now the the oxytocin love potion yeah right so if you were to make a love potion are those the only two ingredients you think you would need well uh if i were to make a love potion uh i think oxytocin might be the only thing that i need <laughs> so i guess that you should probably step back and actually define what is oxytocin right so oxytocin uh, is uh, a neurotransmitter and it's a really interesting little molecule in that it's not just a neurotransmitter it also acts as a hormone mm, okay. so uh neurotransmitters are chemicals that the uh cells of the brain, the neurons, used to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so neurons are these really amazing cell types, right? They have these long uh, tendril-like projections that they uh, use to contact each other. Mm -hmm. And at the tips of these projections, uh, they come into contact with each other at sites called synapses, mm -hmm. right? At the synapse, the two cells are really, really close to each other, but not quite touching. Uh, and in between them is what's called the synaptic cleft. 
And in the synaptic cleft, one neuron wants to talk to another. It will uh, squirt out a little bit of neurotransmitter. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> the other cell will have uh, receptors for that neurotransmitter uh, mm -hmm. on its surface. And these receptors uh, will bind to that neurotransmitter and send some signal to that other neuron, mm -hmm. uh, like act, you know, activate or uh, be quiet or something like that. Right, right. Um, so oxytocin is used uh, in the brain as a neurotransmitter um, to, uh, to communicate between neurons. Uh, yeah. And it's made by you know, a sub subset of neurons uh, in the hypothalamus. Uh -huh. And uh, these neurons use ox oxytocin to talk to other neurons within the brain. OK. But interestingly, it also releases oxytocin into the bloodstream. Oh, okay. Yes, the hypothalamus pumps oxytocin uh, directly into the bloodstream to have effects throughout the body. Huh, so what exactly Very is cool. it doing, what you just said, <laughs> when it goes into the bloodstream, it's going to so, the rest yeah, of the body. So, so this is actually a really active area of research. So yeah. um, there is a lot that's known about the peripheral effects within the, you know, when the oxytocin goes into the bloodstream uh -huh. because those are easier to study. Okay. Um, yes. you know, we know that it's involved in childbirth mm -hmm. uh, to uh, control contractions. Uh, it's also uh, involved in lactation. And, but these effects are easier to study than the effects that happen within the brain. Right, The right. brain of a human is a really hard thing to study. It's far <laughs> less accessible, I would think. Than, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really hard to find people that are willing to let you crack open their head and look <laughs> at enough. their brain. So uh, it, it's a hard thing to, to know about what's, what's going on with oxytocin in the brain. Yeah, most definitely. And so yeah. just in the TV show, they get the oxytocin from a vole, but you're saying that we also have oxytocin in our own bodies. That's so. right. That's right. So there are oxytocin. The oxytocin is uh, conserved throughout mm -hmm. evolution. So we have oxytocin just like a volt would. I see. So if Rick needed not only oxytocin but also DNA from Morty, why not just collect oxytocin from Morty himself? Why collect it from a vole? Ah, well, oxytocin uh, is pretty well conserved, and so the oxytocin from the vole is similar enough that uh, oh. presumably if you were to uh, inject it into a human, uh, it, it should work at the human receptors. I now, uh, you know, I, I haven't confirmed this. <laughs> I don't think anyone has. Uh, but presumably uh, that, that should be yeah. the case. So in the TV show, it works almost too well. So Morty <laughs> puts it on his crush... Jessica, and then she has a flu because, of course, it's flu season, <laughs> and then it kind of spreads all throughout the city, and the whole city is now in love with Morty. So I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, why is oxytocin so closely thought of as a love potion or related to love? Uh, oxytocin has been associated with pair bonding behavior. And it's been associated with parabonding behavior in voles. And so this is one of the things that I wanted to give props to the creators of Rick and Morty for, that they uh, were aware of this at all. So what do you mean by parabonding? Does that mean like, so mate moles, for life? Yeah, oh. voles will mate for life. <laughs> They That's awesome. Will, uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, so they, and it's certain species of voles, it's not all voles. So a group at the University of Florida in Tallahassee, uh, headed up by Hui Wang, has shown that in prairie voles, there's, there are some species that do mate for life mm -hmm. and are monogamous, and some species that are not. Okay. Now, they were first able to show that in the brains of voles who, had, who were monogamous and who had already involved in a monogamous relationship, they had more receptors for oxytocin in their oh, brains. interesting. And they were also then able to show uh, that if you give oxytocin to the voles that don't mate, the, uh -huh. the species that don't mate for life, then they engage in monogamous pair bonding. Whoa. Oh, like a love potion. Like a love potion. <laughs> that's exactly. Crazy. Uh, so that's uh, one of the pieces of evidence that we have that's, that really strongly implies oxytocin in uh, you know, pair bonding behavior, or you might say love. Although it's a little bit weird to talk about love in the context of a vole. I yeah. don't know if <laughs> voles pair bond because they fall in love with each other, or right. if it has anything to they do with what we experience interests. as love. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, they might not like the same TV yeah. shows. Or yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's hard exactly. to have those deep conversations with fools. Exactly. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. And does it matter? You said oxytocin is produced in the brain, but also in the bloodstream. So does it matter where the oxytocin is given to the voles? That's a great question. So exactly. The, the oxytocin administration to the voles was directly administered in the brain. So it, uh, they actually injected into the nucleus accumbens, which is a brain area that uh, we know is involved uh, with uh, these sorts of things. So we uh, could talk about you know, the uh, method of the site of action of this love potion, right? Mm-hmm. So if you were to make a love potion with oxytocin, you need to get it to the brain. Oh. It's not enough to just get this into the bloodstream. I see. Because our brains have a thing called the blood-brain barrier oh. that uh, are, is really good at keeping things separated between the rest of the body and the brain. Right, right. And, uh, you know, this is really important for protecting your brain from all kinds of things. Okay. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's really important to keep that in mind when you talk about, uh, you know, drugs like this. Uh, you know, so another example of something, you know, to keep in mind is when you take things like melatonin, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it, it, it's important to remember that uh, you have to consider, is the melatonin actually getting through your digestive system, into your bloodstream, and then into the brain, right? right? So these are actually uh, th- really things, to, they're, they're important things to consider when you're consuming uh, mm-hmm. uh, things like this. Yeah. But, uh, but back to the, the love potion, you would need to have this thing get into the brain. Some so, sort of delivery system. Yeah, then. so this is one hiccup of the, of the love <laughs> brain, uh, yeah. potion where, you know, it might be a little difficult to subtly inject oxytocin into someone's brain. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, you can't just subtly stick a needle in someone's brain and say, hey, I don't know <laughs> what happened. Floor. Yeah, on the dance floor. Yeah, if you're in love with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> And it even spreads further. So Morty spreads it by just touching the person he has a crush on. But because she has the flu, it spreads everywhere because of the flu virus. So I guess are viruses a way you can transmit things? And Yeah, right. So this is interesting. The, the, the effect of the love potion is transferred by the flu virus, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting in that if part of the love potion is Morty's DNA, mm-hmm. there is... Uh, a possibility that if the DNA in Morty's hair in the love potion somehow in, was incorporated into the flu virus, then the flu virus could oh. pass on Morty's DNA to oh. the people who were infected by the virus. Uh, so viruses are basically little DNA delivery robots, me- little little tiny mechanisms of, deli- of DNA delivery. That's all they are. They're not alive. They're just little th- you know, things that... that grab onto cells and inject their DNA. And then they hijack those cells to make more viruses. Uh Um, But viruses actually have been used uh, by researchers uh, to deliver DNA in other contexts. So we can actually, uh, in the lab, take a a gene, the DNA that we're interested in, and put in a virus uh-huh. uh, and then give that virus uh, to you know a certain group of cells that we're interested in mm-hmm. and have those cells express that gene oh, okay. uh, by just injecting that, that gene in, into those cells. So these are special viruses, obviously. Yeah. They're, they're not wild viruses that induce uh, disease. You know, they're mm-hmm. actually uh, specially made bioengineered viruses that, that do this as a special thing. But if we're going to stretch a little bit, we could say <laughs> yeah. maybe... If the DNA was randomly somehow incorporated into the virus genome, yeah. then it could have yeah. it could be passed on to another uh, another person. Hmm. But <laughs> and here's the but. Yeah, there's a yeah. big but oxytocin there. is not DNA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a big. Yeah. Uh, so you could not take oxytocin and have it be taken up by a virus and right. then give the oxytocin to another person. So really they'd just be transferring Morty's DNA, but not the associated oxytocin. Exactly, exactly. Uh. So, you know, you could in theory uh, have some cells in the other person's body that are now part Morty. Morty. <laughs> <laughs> now that's more terrifying, I think. Yeah. That is pretty terrifying. This episode gets a little sinister, though. It does, yeah. It does. So something does. that they do, if I remember correctly, something that they do spread, though, is like it's praying mantis DNA? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, right, right. And then they start turning into giant praying mantis. This right? spirals out of control. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Where, you know, Rick is feeding different is bits of DNA into <laughs> yeah. the flu virus yeah. and giving it to everyone. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a 
big stretch to right. think that if you were to take some praying mantis DNA and put it into a virus and give it to someone that right. they would turn into a, a, a half yeah. praying mantis half human <laughs> uh, but you know it as I said as a very big stretch you could say that maybe uh, you know you could have those that person's uh, cells express a little bit of praying mantis DNA right. and have some <laughs> some weirdness associated with that um, you know, this is actually being used in uh, things like gene therapy, uh, right? Oh, so okay. we're developing at the moment these therapies where you can use viruses to uh, go into a person's cells, eject some DNA, mm -hmm. uh, and fix something that's wrong in the genome. Oh, so wow. one, we're, yeah. one area that this has actually worked is in uh, certain kinds of blindness. So certain okay. kinds of blindness are caused by these proteins that are being made by genes in cells in the eye that are broken. Mm -hmm. And if you all you have to do is put the the correct unbroken version of that gene into a virus and inject it into the eye and have those cells take up this DNA and start expressing the right thing, oh, and you can see. fix a disease like that. So it's actually got really awesome That's implications. Great. This kind yeah. of technology is, uh, I think, really promising. And, you know, once yeah. we can get it to the point where we're very confident that that's all it's doing, right. then, you know, <laughs> we can get it uh, approved by the FDA and, oh, and, sweet. and these uh, the kinds of therapies. I, I hope will be a big part of medicine in the future. Yeah, that's very cool. sure. So you had mentioned mm -hmm. um, were some surprising results from the Douglas Lab. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, are you guys studying oxytocin? Like, I don't actually mm -hmm. know too much about what you guys are studying to bring it back yeah. to yeah. your research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What we are trying to do is, um, what we're focusing on are the neurons that are, uh, you know, using oxytocin within the brain. I see. And it's really hard to study yeah, those yeah. in humans, but in a fish, we yeah. have at really, you know, they're yeah. really accessible and, and it's easier to study. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, so obviously it's a lot easier to study something in the periphery. The brain's a little harder to get to. People don't like their brains being, you know, drilled into, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But we have animal models, and I guess, I are they doing research right now to see what oxytocin does in the brain? That's right, actually, yeah. So our lab, uh, in particular, is using uh, a fish model to hmm. study the role of oxytocin within the brain. Uh, so in a human, uh, what people are, are able to do is, like I said, look at oxytocin within the blood. Um, and in the brain, you can use a tool like fMRI to look at okay. uh, what areas of the brain are active. And if you see a region of the brain that's active that you know has oxytocin neurons in it, you can draw some reasonable conclusions about, you know, okay, it looks like oxytocin neurons might be active. The problem with that approach is that the resolution of fMRI is pretty low, meaning when you see a little bit of the brain light up, there are oxytocin neurons in that little bit of the brain, but there are also tens of thousands of other neurons within yeah, that yeah, little bit yeah. of the brain. <laughs> and, and you know, you're not sure if it's exactly the oxytocin neurons. So what we're doing is using uh, zebrafish, which allows us to uh, study the oxytocin neurons in the brain uh, at a cellular resolution, meaning uh, we can actually image these neurons and uh, see when they are active uh, within a behaving animal, uh, non-invasively, and we can do this uh, and, and we have a cellular resolution, meaning we can wow. see the activity of individual neurons. Wow. Um, and so this, this gives us a lot more uh, information about what, exactly what the oxytocin neurons are doing. Wow. Uh, and we also have a higher temporal resolution, so we can get really precise ideas about uh, when the neurons are active. And, and so uh, we're learning, actually, uh, now that we think that oxytocin is involved in the modulation of pain responses, hmm. uh, okay. which is a really interesting finding. Um, and you know, I, I can't talk too much about the details of this. Oh, it's it's hush, still, hush. Yeah, still unpublished. <laughs> Hot off the uh, but uh, <laughs> stay tuned for uh, <laughs> some uh, some research coming out of both the Douglas Labs uh, and the, the Ingert Lab. So we're yeah. doing this as wow. a part of a, co a collaboration with Florian Ingert's lab okay. uh, at Harvard. Uh, this is the project is being headed up by a. Uh, postdoc in the lab, Caroline Wee. Okay. Uh, and so, so yeah, and we'll be following up on that afterwards. So we, we're definitely able to use animal models to 
yeah. to study this kind of thing. That, that sounds, sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, we like it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. It's not my project, but uh, I think it's it's definitely one of the most interesting things that, yeah. that is going on in the lab right well, now. It's great. Love can lead to pain. So cool. yeah, pain. Yeah. Yeah. Love is yeah. pain. Yeah. Love is pain. It's getting you ready for yeah. the, the pain. For the pain you can experience. <laughs> Just finding the scientific proof to back up that statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if I remember the episode, it's been a while since I watched it. So they turn into praying mantis, and then he tries to fix it mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. another virus? Is that he it? basically, yeah, then he mixes up... Um, he uses a more more contagious virus. A more contagious with, version yeah, of the flu a virus. A thousand different with DNA With a bunch of different <laughs> But DNA he's like, samples. don't you trust me? So he doesn't really like... He doesn't talk about like what exactly is in it. Yeah, and then they turn into monsters, and then they leave that universe and go to a different We're not going to talk about leaving universes in this. <laughs> no. But yeah, like, yeah, the end no. result This is, is like, one of the darkest Rick and Morty yeah. episodes. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. They go to a different universe where they like explode or something or die <laughs> yeah, they and then explode. they just live in a new universe for the rest of the so season. he he mixes koala rattlesnake chimpanzee <gasps> cactus shark golden retriever <laughs> and a smidge of dinosaur <laughs> and then says that that's uh, going to be regular old humanity and <laughs> they'll just get well. everyone back to being human yeah. that's awesome um so we have some questions from our many listeners <laughs> um um, at Varklin asks, um, are there efforts to isolate one desired effect without the side effects of um, oxytocin? So this actually gets at a really critical problem with drugs in general. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about a neurotransmitter like oxytocin, mm -hmm. there are a bunch of different targets in the brain. There are oxytocin neurons that project to multiple parts of the brain and they presumably have multiple different functions. Mm -hmm. And so when you just administer oxytocin or some drug that affects oxytocin receptors, you're going to hit all of those targets. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons that drugs have side effects is that, you know, yes, you might hit the region of the brain that is doing the thing you want to fix, but you're also going to affect all the other targets that use this neurotransmitter. Right. You know, so it, you can't really classify a neurotransmitter as saying it does X in the brain because right. it does a bunch of things in the brain. Right. So, um, this is really, you know, there's really no way about this with current technology. There's no way around it. There, you hmm. uh, just have to deal with the fact that if you administer a drug like this, you're going to hit all of the uh, all of the targets. Right. So if you were to give oxytocin uh, to someone, like I mentioned earlier, yes, you might increase pair bonding behavior, but you also might trigger lactation, uh, <laughs> which might be an unpleasant side effect. So right, right. Uh, there are some very, very uh, speculative methods that I've seen for um, expressing things like oxytocin that mm -hmm. are uh, actually tethered to the membrane uh, mm -hmm. and expressed by a specific cell type. Wow. Uh, so mm -hmm. you would, in that case, have the cell that you're interested in mm -hmm. ex put oxytocin in the synapse and have it tethered to uh, to the, the actual cell. Oh, wow. And that way, you only put it where you want it, okay. and you only have the desired effect without, without the, the oh, off-target really cool. effects. Wow. Um, that would require you using something like gene therapy, like I mentioned earlier, where you actually get a virus and put it into someone that, that takes this gene mm -hmm. uh, for this special tethered oxytocin mm -hmm. and puts it into the oxytocin neuron. I see. So when you say um, using viruses for therapy, are they more specific in the types of cells they can target? So that I, I don't, that's not being, that's not something that exists right now. Yeah. These, these are only being used in, uh, in the lab, you know, in cell culture systems and in animal models um, okay. where but, the animal has that gene from birth. Oh, okay. Um, but with the, the virus methods, then, you know, presumably you would be able to use some sort of system that genetically targets, um, you know, these cells you're interested in. So that oh, only okay. they will take the oxytocin, tethered okay. oxytocin, and, and express it. I see. Yeah. Okay, cool. At Varklin sent another question asking, are there any documented attempts to make a love potion with oxytocin? Uh, we already mentioned the study where oxytocin was administered to the brains of these voles that mm -hmm. ended up uh, causing them to engage in monogamous behavior. And that's the only study that I'm aware of uh, mm -hmm. that, that has done this kind of thing. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anyone else has actually done this. Okay. 
And definitely not in humans. Right. You know <laughs> what? I'll take of. that back. <laughs> I would be willing to bet that someone throughout history has attempted to make yeah. love motion <laughs> with oxytocin uh, in in their garage or yeah, something. Yeah, the scientific uh, but rigor, though. This is certainly <laughs> not NIH-funded research yeah. in, a, in a legitimate laboratory. Actually, that leads to a Yahoo question we found. Um, so someone on Yahoo was wondering, how would I make homemade oxytocin. So they then go on to explain the reasoning behind this, which is, I heard that oxytocin showed that it was a miracle drug for anxiety reduction in studies, so we can talk about if that's true or not. But they also say supplementing the natural levels was beneficial, but it is hard to find pure oxytocin for sale. Okay. Would it be possible to make from household chemicals and over-the-counter medicines? Could I extract peak precursors from any kind of plant or mushroom. I have some makeshift labware, for example, teapots, old drinking water tubing, medicine <laughs> syringes, water bottles to use as flasks, etc. All in my garage, which I use for alchemy. Nice. What would, it happen, <laughs> would you happen to think of any way I might produce measurable amounts of oxytocin? So I guess given his garage lab <laughs> and his teapots <laughs> that he has to use for flasks... Do you think making lab oxytocin is possible? And it seems like we already talked about it may not even have the effects that you would want to begin with. Well, you know, uh, part of me doesn't want to help this person because it seems yeah. like what they're doing is pretty dangerous. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I would not recommend, let's be very clear, uh, trying to create any kind of drug in your garage using mm -hmm. old drinking water tubing. Uh, and teapots. Yes. <laughs> well, it sounds like he's already using it for alchemy, which what I thought was turning like rocks into gold. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. So it, yeah. I mean, questionable if, results from those two. I would think. <laughs> if they've got that working, then I guess you, you could trust them to make oxytocin. But uh, gold. so where to start with this one? Um, the you cannot make it from any kind of plant or mushroom because this is an animal-based molecule. Uh, I, I am not aware of any plants that use oxytocin. Um, uh, no, no. There's really, there's really no way that, that I, I could imagine you could make oxytocin in a lab. Oxytocin is a peptide neurotransmitter, meaning uh, it is actually encoded in, in a gene uh, and it's transcribed uh, by mm -hmm. the cell into a protein, mm -hmm. and and that's it. It's yeah. it's made, you know, uh, uh, through the translational process of, of of taking a bit of DNA and and turning it into a protein. Nice. So that those kinds of things are really basically impossible to yeah. to make. So not outside only of the cell. not only is this garage lab dangerous, it also won't work. No, is not at what all. You're saying? No, this do is, not do this. This is not going to work. <laughs> Please uh, don't do I this. Think, yeah, <laughs> right. we, we can pretty safely say that. So there's also another Yahoo question. Does touching pets release oxytocin? Yes. So oh. interestingly, not just touching pets, but apparently just looking at your pets releases oxytocin. So I actually found a paper um, out of Japan, uh, headed up by Miho Nagasawa, that found that just gazing into the eyes of your dog Aww. can trigger release of oxytocin in both you and your dog. Uh, now, again, this is peripheral oxytocin, so they detect it in urine. Uh, and so this is, uh, interestingly, uh, not in the brain, but there is some stimulation of the oxytocin system, definitely, when, when you're interacting with your dog, which is adorable. That, that is, is amazing. Adorable. Dogs look the best. <laughs> That's why they make such good therapy animals. Right? That's exactly yeah. right. Because <laughs> they love us. <laughs> Clearly, I need to go get like five more dogs. <laughs> I could use that yes. oxytocin release. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a lot of interest. The other Yahoo questions we found were all related in some way or another of how can I make oxytocin or use it as a perfume? So not only does Morty want to use this, I guess, for ethically questionable reasons, but it sounds like other people out in the Yahoo world also are wondering the same thing. So um, I guess, could oxytocin be used as a perfume or something like that? My answer would have to be no. I would suggest, I, I would suspect that 
if you administered oxytocin as a perfume or uh, in some other way, that it wouldn't get into the brain. And therefore, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have the effects on behavior that mm-hmm. you're wanting. I see. It might have those peripheral effects. Uh, so you might end up, like I said, making some sort of lactation serum. Oh, uh, oh God. Not, not the something. original You're not going to get yes. the <laughs> Yes, I see. So yeah. if I do a Google search and I find some products that claim to be a spray-on oxytocin, I should stay away. Yeah, I would recommend that that you stay away from those products. Uh, really Be no very skeptical when you come across things like that. Yeah, yeah. sounds Great. about right. All right, so we have um, another Twitter question from at Horse Avoider. Nice name. Which commonly owned pet would you combine with mantis DNA in order to make the most dangerous animal possible? So let's pretend that whatever happened in Rick and Morty with that virus carrying the mantis DNA is actually possible. What would mm-hmm. you combine with it in order to make a really terrifying creature. Mm. Oh man. Okay. So my mind immediately goes to the cone snail because Ooh, this that? has been I've been something I've been thinking about lately. <laughs> um, some some of our colleagues here are studying these snails and mm. they uh, have these venoms that they uh, use to eat fish. These are tiny tiny snails that are able to eat small fish be, by paralyzing them first with oh, these no. toxic venoms oh that uh, attack the nervous system. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. Of really, really fascinating and interesting ways. Yeah. Oh, that'd be terrifying. <laughs> yes. So uh, poisonous praying mantis. Oh, my gosh. That paralyzes you instantly. Uh, sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound really scary. So how do they, they inject this venom? Do they Are they able to like, they shoot it into the They have a proboscis. Fish? That, that they can extend. It's like a long tongue. Oh my god! Say. So a poison tongue. Uh, and they they extend it and they uh, just poke the the fish, oh and it's just one small sting, and oh. uh, it can completely shut down the entire nervous system of the Nature fish. It's an extremely metal. potent <laughs> neuro uh, neurotoxin. Yeah. yeah. So and which pet or not pet doesn't have to be anything. Would you? Combined with mantis DNA. Okay, so in the show, the mantis DNA turns everyone in the whole city into these mantis monsters, yeah. right? So I think if I had the way of turning everyone into a city into one sort of animal, I'd probably not do a dangerous animal, but I'd use golden retriever DNA and just make the world's happiest city. <laughs> and so we could just frolic in the town and you know have oxytocin release through eye contact and I love it. I, instead of being terrified of these cone snail toxins <laughs> I would just live in my best world I could imagine yeah. which is instead of people there are golden retreats where everyone falls in love with each other yeah yes. everyone's just happy all the time and there's probably a lot of like uh like golden retriever hair everywhere, and it's a mess, but everyone's happy. So, <laughs> but do you think all the golden retrievers would fight over who's the best dog? Uh, they're all the best. <laughs> That's the <laughs> only answer. That's yes. true. Every dog's the best dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. So, if I had that power, I think I would probably go golden retriever. Oh, fair enough. What Let's about you, Heidi? See. What would I pick? Now I want to change my answer because that was so good. Uh, I'm sorry. You could no bring it back into the dark world. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Of what, if, yeah, what if we just so do the opposite? What if we change everyone to cats? Oh. <laughs> It'd be the most apathetic and world. No one, cares. <laughs> no one would care about anyone. No one would notice. Yeah, the cats would have no idea. <laughs> just go on living their lives. They just like. go on living their lives, yeah. I mean, it could still be a great life because you just yeah. wouldn't care. Be very self-sufficient. It would be. Yeah. You know? yeah. Just take care of yourself, you and your own. Very well-run city of <laughs> yeah, only <fair>. cats. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be nothing on a table. Everything yeah. would be knocked off. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. I like these worlds we're creating. I know. <laughs> I do, too. I want to live in them. Maybe not mine. <laughs> yours would be terrifying. I'm live your, in golden retriever yours world. was the best Twitter. Like that yes. was the only one that actually answered the question. Though, yeah. To be fair, because that would be a very dangerous, dangerous place. That one's to for be. you, horse avoider. Yes, thank you, horse avoider. Thank you. And thank you, Josh, for yes. being on our episode today and sharing your knowledge. You're very welcome. You're thank excited. you for having me on. I really, that's a lot of fun. If you'd like to learn more about our guest's research or the topics that were covered in today's episode, check out our website at cinemasciencepodcast.com. You can find us collectively on Twitter at CinemaSciCast, and you can find Heidi at PandaBumHa. Anne doesn't have a Twitter, but her dog Hubble sure does. You can find him at Hubble Gibson. Our intro and outro music was composed by Kagan Breitenbach. 
You can find more information about him at our website, but also check out his personal website at kaganbreitenbach.com. The first season of Cinema Science was graciously funded by the University of Utah's Neuroscience Initiative. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Bye.